take your Bibles and go to Exodus this morning. Exodus chapter 20. Last week we covered the first of the Ten Commandments. This week we are going to do the second of the Ten Commandments. And you know, sometimes people, you know, don't get bored just because you know all the Ten Commandments, all right? You think, a lot of people are thinking they're obeying the Ten Commandments. They think they, they got them down. I covered some of this last week. You're going to find out we are not as good at keeping these commandments as we think we are. And, I, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with all these messages on the Ten Commandments. Now, there's a lot of great things about each one that I want to cover. But ultimately, I've got somewhere I want to get, something that I'm hoping everyone will clearly see by the end of these. But let's go ahead and read uh, verse 4 of, Rev, of Exodus chapter 20. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So right there we see the second of the Ten Commandments about not making graven images, not bowing ourselves to them. God hates that and we uh, n- another term we use for that is idolatry. Idolatry is a very wicked sin. It's one that Israel constantly dealt with. They were constantly getting in trouble for going after idols, worshiping idols, and you know making these images of things, making high places for them, worshiping them. I mean, they were turning their hearts from God. I mean, imagine you know the story that one of the stories that just blows my mind in the Bible is that you know you read the story of Israel crossing the Red Sea. Now, I don't know about you, but that w- I would have been pretty impressed with God on that day. I mean, the way he parted the Red Sea, you know Moses didn't do, it, didn't do that. They knew God did that. But what did they do shortly after that? They had Aaron make him a golden calf to worship. And they said, these be the gods that brought us out of Egypt. One of those wimpy, nothing Egyptian gods that God had defeated. God defeated all their gods with those ten plagues that they had and did all these miracles for them. And they went and took, and they made a graven image and wanted to worship that instead. I mean, that, that story just blows my mind when I read that, how wicked that was. But listen, idolatry, it is, it is a wicked sin. In the New Testament, it's mentioned many times. You know, little children, keep yourself from idols. Idolatry, it is still bad today. And I don't know, you know, I... I don't, I don't believe we need to be making statues of Jesus and of you know, different characters from the Bible like a lot of religions do. You've got people that will make these pilgrimages down to Rio de Janeiro. they got that gigantic Jesus statue down there. And they go and they have a big religious experience while they're there. I get absolutely creeped out every time I drive by in Dixon, I think that Catholic school, and it has that statue of Mary and all the statues of the little children on their knees before her. I mean, it's like idols worshiping an idol i mean it's just it's double creepy the fact that you know one it's an idol two they've just got little kids on their knees before mary and i'm telling you even if those little kids were on their knees worshiping jesus that'd still be creepy that's still idolatry that's still wrong but i don't know that i get disturbed every time i drive by there and i look at that and i did one time i thought you know what do the catholics do about thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images you know, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And I went on one of the websites of the one right here in town on their doctrinal statement, and it has the Ten Commandments on there. You know, we believe in the Ten Commandments. And I started reading the Ten Commandments, and they skipped, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. But I'm like, wait a minute, there's got to be ten. You know, but there were still ten. And I'm looking through, and I'm like, they still have ten on there. And if you read them, it's when it gets to Thou shalt not covet, they have Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's or anything that's thy neighbor's or something like that. They put thou shalt not covet twice because they had, they had to skip that one because they clearly are violating that commandment. It's all over in their buildings. And you might say that's innocent. I don't see what the big deal is about statues and images. You might not think that's a big deal, but I'm going to show you why it's a problem what it is that God hates about it. Because look at, go ahead and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You know, one thing, you know, it, we, gotta be, you know, we need to be careful with this. What I'm going to show you here, I think it can be taken the wrong way. I don't want to send 
a wrong message right here. But we clearly today have greater knowledge in many areas than they did way back then. There's things that we understand more now, not just as Christians, but as people. There are some things we understand as Christians that maybe the world doesn't understand, but you know, there was a time when it would have been very easy to make an image of some, you know, God with a little G and to convince people that it had power. Okay? We know that that's happened in many different places on the earth throughout history where people were convinced that a statue had some kind of power. Okay? It, it was very easy at one time. Today, you're going to have a tough time pulling that off, aren't you? Today, you're going to have a hard time convincing somebody that a statue has any real power, especially in America. So other countries, you could probably get away with a little more. I'm not saying it's, it's less of a sin today, but understand they did have a lot more power back then. And today as Christians, okay, you know, what if I had, what if you brought a statue of Jesus to me? Okay. You know, what if you, uh, you know, gave me an idol, you know, I, honestly, I'm not going to be scared of it. I'm not going to keep it for, you know, for several reasons, but look at, look what it says in first Corinthians eight. It says, now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as, uh, as yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things offered on, in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is none other but uh, God but one. Okay, We know that an idol is nothing. If you bring me a statue, that statue will have no power with me. All right. If you decide you're going to creep me out and you're going to like put some statue of Buddha in my office and make me think that you know you now have just you know taken over our church and you know Buddhism is going to die, I'm not going to be scared of that one bit. I'm going to throw that thing out because of what it represents. It's not going to bother me one bit. I'm not scared of idols. I don't believe in them, but I'm not scared of them at all. Whenever uh, my wife, she's got a lot of Catholics in her family, and one day they left this big stone. Catholic statue of a baby angel at her dad's grave. And her dad was a Baptist. He didn't believe in idolatry or anything like that. And so we don't know who it was for sure that left. Well, we didn't at the time. We found out later. But uh, we never told them what happened. But we got rid of the statue. And we, we actually took it to my parents' house and we put it in their garden as kind of a prank, knowing they would probably think somebody from the church did it trying to be nice, and we wanted to see what they would do because they were getting ready to have a picnic. We wanted to see if they would throw it away or if they would leave it there, not wanting to hurt somebody's feelings. We want, you know, And, uh, and they, it was funny. You know, we, of course, let them know it was us before uh, the picnic or anything came. But you know what we ended up doing with that statue? We went and took it, and we used it for target practice with a twenty two. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, was, it was fun. Now, you know, how, how, how could you do that? We were able to do that because it's nothing. I I wasn't scared. I didn't go to bed that night thinking some baby angels were going to come attack me, you know, because I, you know, I, you know, defiled one of their idols. An idol is nothing, okay? To me especially, now to some people it might be. I wouldn't do that. Uh, I wouldn't do that publicly in front of certain people. That would probably be offensive to them. It would send a wrong message. If you gave me a statue of Jesus, I would throw that statue in, in the garbage. All right, or I tell you I, I don't want it, but I wouldn't go out in public and be you know smashing it in public. It would send a wrong message, okay? Because some people they think an idol is something. They and I, I know it's nothing, so it's gonna it it would do absolutely nothing to me. I understand all that, but so now that we know that our idol's not a big deal, okay? Because here's the thing: the reason God had there was some very specific reason God had such a problem with idolatry and it's important that we understand that to make sure we don't violate this or break this commandment of you know making any graven images and bowing ourselves down to them most of us in here would never do that we would never kneel before us we would never kneel before a statue or anything like that we know that it's nothing but i do believe in our own way we make graven images in our own life and we bow ourselves down to them we worship them we serve them see god doesn't want because here was god's problem look at what it says in verse five this was, this was God's problem with idols. He said, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. 
Y'all see that? Our God is a jealous God. Our God deserves every bit of our love. We talked about that some last week. Our God, He should be the ultimate authority in our life. He should be number one. God deserves that. God demands that. He has every right to ask for that. God is the creator of this universe. By Him, all things consist. God is not out of line one bit when He asks and when He demands 100% love and loyalty and service to Him. He has every right in the world to do that. This is His world. This is His universe. Your body belongs to Him. You've been bought with a price. He has every right to do that. And God does not want anything in our life that would steal our affection from Him. That was why God didn't like them having idols. God did not want them looking to an idol instead of looking to Him. He was God. He was their Creator. He was the one that they were supposed to serve. And see, and if God doesn't want our affection stolen, if that's God's main problem with idols, He doesn't want our affection stolen, then would an idol be limited to a graven image? Okay? Now think about it. Back in, back in those days, what else did they have? What else could they have for an idol? I mean, they lived very primitive lives in comparison to what we live today. You know, they, uh, during that time, they were wandering around dwelling in tents, you know, and they, they didn't have the technology. They didn't have the things we had. And the truth is, you know, the most, probably the most impressive things that they had back then would be an idol. Think about that. We would be bored with an idol today. Why? We've got cell phones. We've got televisions. We've got all these other things to keep us occupied. But back then, they didn't have much stuff. You know, the, you know, we have, I mean, I'm constantly amazed with the new technology and things we have. I was amazed. I was in the cell phone store the one day and I was messing around with one of those virtual reality things where you can like look all over the place and you're like in another world. I'm like, man, this is really cool. This is neat. You know, why would we care about a statue in a world where we have virtual reality? You know, I mean, why would we, you know, we we're not going to care about those things. But, you know, back in the Bible days, the graven image was one of the only things that could be an idol. And I believe today, because of technology, we've made many things. We have many things that can steal our affections from God. For, you know, just money, okay? Not so much the money itself, but what we can do with that money, what we can accumulate for ourselves. The Bible says, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. People, they worship it, they serve it. Everything they do is for it. You say, oh, I've never bowed down before money. But you know what? Your boss will tell you, you know, to do something against, you know, what you're supposed to do. You know, work on Sunday and I'll give you a little bit more. And what do you do? You serve him. Just because he offered you a little more money. It's amazing how people will bend over backwards and they'll serve the world. They'll serve everybody else if they just offer them a little money. You're not on your knees worshiping them, but you're definitely serving them. You're doing whatever they tell you to do. You've allowed that money to steal your affection from God. You get so caught up in making money, you don't have time for the things of God. You're not even interested in reading the Bible. You're not interested in church. You're not interested in being a witness. You're not interested in any of those things. Why? Because you're concentrated. Your life, your focus is on these other things. You know, the money, you know, the, the technology, the, you know, uh, one thing that is real big today that people idolize are celebrities. Okay? It, now think about it. Back in those days, it would be hard to be a celebrity, wouldn't it? They didn't have television. They didn't have social media. They didn't have all those things. Okay, have you ever, have you ever got to meet somebody that was famous And, you know, one of the things that people usually say after they meet somebody that's famous in person is they seem like a normal person. Well, you know why? Because they are just people. They are just normal people. There really isn't anything special about them except we've put them up on a pedestal. We've made an idol out of them. And and celebrities, I'm telling you, the influence they have on our culture is scary. Okay, we see in the Bible where they would do some crazy things for idols. When they made the golden calf, what did they do? They pretty much stripped naked. They started acting like a bunch of heathen. We see in the story of Elijah uh, when he had that contest with the prophets of Baal. I mean, those guys started cutting themselves trying to get the, their idols' attention. And yet, look at what people do today. We say, you know, we're not idolatrous in this country today, but look at what people will do just to get a glimpse of a celebrity. 
You know, when they go to these concerts, the way people just scream and go crazy and sometimes do violent, vulgar things just to try to get their attention. Why? Because they're famous. It's ridiculous. We see it with politicians. We saw it with, and when President Obama, uh, there was people that would, would faint in his presence. You know, why? He's, man, Elvis, same thing with Elvis. I've seen some of the videos of Elvis back in his day with just women going crazy. You know, why? I don't know, maybe you have to be a woman to understand that. You know, I, I don't get it. <laughs> I, 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 you know what, that, that's wrong. But we do, we idolize people. And we will let people steal our affections from God. Even preachers sometimes. There's a lot of preachers I know that are literally idols. They're big shots. They're, that people, they'll go to them. And if it's, a, if it's a question of what does the Bible say and what does this preacher say, they're going to go by what the preacher says. Why they've idolized him. And they have allowed even preachers sometimes to steal their affections from God. And let me tell you, God hates that. Why? Because he is a jealous God. Hey, this is, his, this is God's word. God doesn't want you listening to man's word over his word. God has a problem with that. Why? Because he's a jealous God and he has every right to be jealous. But we see that an idol... Okay, look, go turn over to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. This is, this is another problem with idols. See, God didn't like them because they steal our affections from Him. But also look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Y'all see that? You know what the problem is with an idol? It is, it's what we've done. It's what we have produced, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I am impressed with artistic people, okay? I mean, I, I can't even draw a good stick figure, all right? And, but, I mean, people, you know, we went to the pilots competition with the kids, and we were looking at some of the drawings that some of these teenagers did, and I, it, it blew my mind. I could not do that to say, I couldn't trace that. I, I, I could not do that. But I'm even more amazed when I see people that can take a hunk of rock or wood. How about these chainsaw guys that will carve things with a chainsaw? What in the world? The people that do these ice sculptures. I mean, that is an incredible talent. I will give you that. That is impressive to be able to, to do that. I can't even make a graven image out of Plato. All right. And let alone doing it out of rock. That is, that's impressive. Okay. And you know what? We still have some of these things today that are you know big attractions. I'll talk about some of those in a little bit. But you know what? We also have today that we idolize the work of man's hands is things like the technology or even buildings and things. We get caught up in what we can build, what we can accomplish, what we can do with our own hands. You know what? It usually impresses people with churches these days. It's not the people in the church. It's not the doctrine that's in the church. It's not anything like that. It's, wow, look at that building. You know, look at what they built. Look at what they produced. And even buildings become idols sometimes. And some churches out there, and listen, I'm not against having a big building. If you need a big building, you got to have a big building. But at the same time, some of these churches, they go so much in debt for these palatial buildings that they literally now, they can't preach the truth anymore because they're not serving God anymore. You know what they're doing? They're serving the people in the church. And we can't offend anybody because if we lose their offering, we lose our building. And the building has become the focal point. It's become the center of attention. It's what they're serving. It is the idol. And it is the work of man's hands. And people do it. You know, preachers do it all the time. It's like, you know, they'll look and they'll go and they'll see the land. They'll see the buildings. Wow. Building a great work here. Well, I didn't, you know, if buildings and things like that are great works, then Baptists are way behind a lot of, you know, the great men like Donald Trump and his skyscrapers that he's built. You know, it's not about buildings, is it? You know, it's about the people. It's about seeing souls saved. It's about being obedient to the scriptures. It's about, you know, a church where you can deliver the truth and uncompromising preaching. In many places, they can't do that. They can't preach the truth. There are many churches today that if, if, they, if they hired me tomorrow and I preached for them like I preached to you all, that church would be done for. You know why? Because all the money is going to leave that church and now it can't function because 
we're serving the building or the bank that actually owns the building. And it's a horrible situation that many churches have got themselves into, and we need to make sure we avoid that. But an idol, it's the work of man's hands. Isn't that what most religions are doing today? When it comes to, hey, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I've been a good person. The work of my hands. I've served in the church. The work of my hands. You know, I go to church. I got baptized. They'll talk about all the things that they have done, the work of their hands. But what is it? What do we have to do to be saved? It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's you stop trusting in your works, the work of your hands, and start trusting Him. And that is how you get saved. And we see today, though, that people are literally, they're just as idolatrous. They might not be kneeling before a statue, but they are serving the work of their hands, which is exactly what the Bible said idols were. They are the work of man's hands. And you say, well, you know, you know how is a statue you know, any worse than anything else that man makes? Well, I guess because a statue, it, it is. It's one of the more impressive things. You know, there are some things we make that aren't that great. Nobody impresses. If I built or made a statue here in town, it would not be a tourist attraction because it would not be impressive. Nobody would care. Nobody would want to see it. It would not change things for this town economically if I did that because it's not impressive. But the right person comes along, the right person who has the right skills, who knows how to do something right. They can get people who come from a long way to see the work of their hands. And we have too many people, they're all caught up in the work of their hands. They don't realize that's idolatry. And so go, turn over to Psalm 135. So, you know, an idol is nothing, but the problem with idol is they steal, many times they would steal our affections from God. They are always the work of man's hands. God's, and anything that steals our affection from God, I believe, is an idol. The work of our own hands are an idol. But look at, here's the, so here's a problem with that. Here's a problem with idols and what they do. It says in Psalm 135, verse 15, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Okay, They always try to use the precious stones. Why? Because that makes it more impressive. You know, Look at all that gold. Look at all that silver. Look, look at the value of that statue. But think about it. A golden statue, while that would be worth you know, a ton of money, what is it accomplishing? You know, what's it producing? Nothing except impressing people. You know, and it, but it does absolutely nothing. But they're, they're silver and gold. They're the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. You see that right there? This is the problem. Another problem with idols. Those who make them are like them. An idol can't do anything. Okay? And when you make an idol, whatever your idol is, you become like that idol. Is that not the case with people? When people are your idol, what do you end up doing? You become like those people. But who are we supposed to be like? We're supposed to be like God. He said, be ye holy, for I am holy. As Christians, we are supposed to be becoming more and more like Christ every day. And as long as our affections are on Him, as long as He is the focal point, we will become more like Christ. But if we start allowing other things to steal our affections, we will become like those things. We will become like those people. Have you ever gone out in public or ever just gone to the mall and you look at some of the crazy things that teenagers are wearing? And you look and you think, why would anybody dress that way? Why would anybody do that to their face? You know why they do that? Because their hero does that. You know, that rock star that they listen to. You know, that movie star. You know, some of the hairdos. All right, you know, nobody's, doing, nobody's got this in here. But you know what? Who gave ladies the idea of shaving the sides of their head? All right, I'm sorry, I got a big problem with that. Okay, you say, oh, there's nothing biblically wrong with it. Well, it's ugly. All right, it's real ugly. I'm just going to tell you right now, ladies shaving the sides of their head is ugly. All right, and I don't believe that's just my opinion. I think that's fact. All right, listen. If you got if, if you shave your head because you have cancer or something like that, you got to do that. People have to do that. But for you, when you are healthy, to just shave the sides of your head is hideous. Who started that? Now I don't know who started that, but I bet if I did my research, I'd probably find it was probably some movie star. 
And it was probably somebody just as vile as all. I don't want to start talking about certain types of our population that are influencing people greatly today, but it was probably one of them. It was, it probably was. And you see, why, why would people do that? Because their idol does that. These people who poke these massive holes in their ears and they stretch their ears out. Okay. That's just gross. Why would somebody do that? You know, you get the right movie star to do it. You get the right celebrity to do it and everybody will do it. I see the things that are going on in churches today. And I look and I'm always like, who started that? And you know, it was some big name, big shot, some celebrity preacher somewhere that people idolize and they see him do it and they all do the same thing too. You will be like your idols. And so you need to stay away from them and you need to focus on Jesus Christ because if you do, you'll be like him. But that's the problem with idols. You will be like them. And if you're serving a statue, you will be absolutely worthless and good for nothing because a statue can do nothing for you. A statue can accomplish nothing. They can't see. They can't hear. And if you're all caught up in worshiping a statue, you're not going to be able to hear anything from the Scripture. You're not going to understand what the Bible says. And you need to get away from those. You need to get away from those idols. Whatever it is, you will be like them. And so those who... Or, you know, we do a disservice to those we turn into idols. We need to understand that too. You know, if you're really that into people, if you love your idols so much, you need to understand you are doing a disservice to people that you idolize. People who idolize other preachers, they do a disservice to preachers. It says in Acts chapter 12 and verse 20, I love this story, but it says, And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him. And having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desiring peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. Herod had accomplished some things that was good for these people. He didn't even really care for these people, but they all start singing his praises. Hey, this isn't a voice of a man. This is a God that is talking. And it says... And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. You all see that? Herod was not all caught up with himself at that time until these people went and started telling him he's a God. And he liked the praise. It's like, you know, he knew he wasn't a God, but you know what? I don't, maybe I'm as close as you can get. I'm quite a guy. And he did it. He took the praise. He took it. And you know what? The angel of the Lord smote him. He was eaten of worms. That doesn't sound like a good way to go. I don't know what that would be like exactly, but that just, that sounds disgusting. And we see that, you know, he died right there. Why? God was angry. God gets angry when people will accept praise that is not theirs. When people will give them credit or when they, when they will accept credit that is not theirs to give. If you read shortly after this story, they tried telling Paul and Barnabas. They tried making gods out of them. And man, those guys, they rent their clothes. They humble themselves and they stop the people. Don't you do this. We are not, we are not idols. We are not, we are not gods. And that made the people mad and they end up, you know, beating them or stoning them. I can't remember what they did exactly, but I mean, it just, it's crazy how much people they want to worship other people and how they want to idolize people. How they, you know, they, they, they want to lift them up. And we, and, but you're doing a terrible disservice. And so, you know, what about having said all this, obviously the real problem with the statue, because we know today that a statue is nothing, but the problem was, you know, they stole the affections away from God. You know, they, uh, they were the work of man's hands. People were basically that worship idols are worshiping what they have accomplished. And those who make them, they're like them. So what, since we know all this, you know, what about a graven image today? Okay, you know, a graven image of men today. All right. Are, are you idolatrous at all? Have idols affected you? Now, I thought about doing some, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I will do a little bit of this, but I, I don't want to get in trouble today. I don't want anybody stoning me today. But you know what? What if I got up here and I started saying things like, Do you know, George Washington was a Mason. Do you know what Thomas Jefferson the guy probably was not saved. The guy wrote his own Bible. 
He denied many of the key doctrines that we believe that the Bible teaches. While the guy had some Christianish things in his life, that guy was probably as lost as all get out. Abraham Lincoln, I don't think he was that great of a president. Anybody getting a little mad right now? Anybody have a problem with me saying anything like that, bringing up some of these men's flaws? Just Listen, nobody's perfect, all right? But why do people get so bent out of shape when we start talking about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln? And I'll throw in Teddy Roosevelt to kind of give you a hint. Okay, I think it was T- Teddy Roosevelt. He was, he was a pretty racist guy. He said some pretty nasty things about colored folks. Anybody getting offended by that? Now, how many of y'all have ever been to Mount Rushmore? Okay, I've, I've been there a couple times. A massive, gigantic, graven images of those four men that I just mentioned. There's statues of those guys all over the place. In Ottawa, I remember when they put a big statue of Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas out there. And you know, we, 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 they, we've got statues of these guys everywhere. And don't you dare say anything against these men. Why? Aren't they just men? Aren't, aren't they capable of being wrong in some areas? Aren't they capable of making mistakes? You know, why, why so offended by them? You know why? Because these people have become idols, haven't they? You know why? Because we literally have idolized them by the statues and things that are out there. And you might think, oh, you know, it doesn't affect me. Yeah, we're not worshiping those, but yet you don't dare say anything against these people. I can't dare say anything against Martin Luther King Jr. when they, after that statue, they put up him in Washington, D.C. But there's plenty of things I can say there. How dare you say that about him? Why are you so defensive about these people? Could it be these idols have influenced you? That they have distorted your thinking and you can't even see reality now? You can't even handle hearing certain truths that these men were just men at best? Why? We're, we are, we're influenced by idols. And so, you know, how do you feel when somebody says something against them? I'm not saying, you know, go, go around bashing everybody that wasn't perfect. But it's funny how we get real sensitive over those that we have idolized in this country. Those who we have put, we've put their images on our most treasured, sought after possessions in the world called money. You know, how could you say anything about those people? I'm just speaking the truth. You say that you say it's not. A, you say you know, we say idols don't affect us today. I'm sorry, idols do affect us today. They do. I mean, you go ahead. You just go to one of these statues sometimes and just start reading off facts about these people that show their humanity that they weren't that great. Some of them, and you know what? You're probably going to get beat up. You know why? Because people come there and they worship those idols. They're not, you know, kneeling before them and bowing all those things, but they clearly have distorted their thinking. And we need to understand that idolatry, it has generational effects. It's bad. It's, God said that he, would, he was a jealous God. And it said He would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And, you know, that verse too, it causes some questions sometimes because Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16 says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. You say, what's the difference between that verse and what God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation? Well, first of all, we have no business in human government punishing the children for the fathers and vice versa. As human government, God has told us you deal with those who did the crime. Okay, but God Himself, okay, God, He can deal justly in those areas. God Himself, He knows what He's doing. He can do it right. He can, he can still be just. But at the same time, you know, as sin, you know, as sinful men, we have to be very careful about how we deal with things because of our imperfections. That's why we just follow the letter of the law. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're not going to deal with family members and things like that because of what somebody else did. But God does do that. God can do that. He has every right to do that. God is perfectly capable of dealing justly with man in his way. But we're not. We've got to just deal with that man 
with that crime. That's what God gave to man. There are some things only God can deal with. And there are some things that God commissioned us to deal with. And we need to understand that too. While there's a lot of sin that goes on in this world, you know, our government, you know, our police, there's just some things they can't, they can't do anything about it without stealing freedom and without making things a lot worse. You know, but you know what? God can deal with those people. But there are some things that God has told us to deal with. Okay, for example, if we have somebody in town that's murdered somebody, you know, the Bible's made it very clear. You deal with that. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. God very clearly gave that to us. But right now, I believe that God, you say, you know, the third and fourth generation, what's that talking about? Well, right now, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but I believe that God, He deals with us through, the way I explain it is through the Word of God, not necessarily the hand of God. So what are you talking about? Well, when God spoke the universe into existence, God set everything into motion. Okay, While God created the universe, He's not controlling it in the sense that if God got distracted for a minute, everything's going to fall apart. We see in the Bible that on the seventh day, God rested. God kind of set everything in motion. And whenever we sin, whenever we do wrong, on one hand, you could say that the planet takes care of us. Okay, now I'm not making the planet of God. God made the planet. He made this planet to do these things. But if you go back and you read in uh, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22 uh, through 30, we don't have time to read it, but we see where God talks about, you know, the abominations people commit, you know, the homosexuality, the bestiality, things like that. The Bible says that the people who do those things, the land itself vomiteth out the inhabitants. Why is that? It's, it's, today we call that disease. You know, we call those things, you know, STDs or whatever. Why? Because there are certain sins that do have serious effects, that have generational effects. And after the fall of man, God cursed the man, the woman, God cursed the ground. And there are certain laws of nature. There are certain things. Hey, if I, if I don't raise my kids right, there's a good chance they're not going to turn out good. If I teach them wrong, if I, you know, if, if I commit certain sins, my children will be more likely to commit those sins. If I if, allow drinking in my house, if my kids see me drinking, there is a better chance that they will become a drunkard. It's just it's how it works. So, and there's there's many examples. We don't have time to go into everything the scripture has to say on that, but we see that how you know the father sins in one area, and how many times the children do the same thing. I mean, I've seen it before where, you know, the father dies an alcoholic and many of the children die an alcoholic. You would think the children would see the father die that way and they'd say, I'm not going to do that, but that's not the way it usually goes. You know, the father is unfaithful to his, his wife and the, chil- the children end up doing the same thing. Why? Why? There's a lot of reasons we could say, but, you know, that, that was how they were raised. That, was, that is what they know. That is how they live. And there are effects that go for generations for sin and idolatry is no exception. If you get caught up in idols, your children will probably get caught up in idols and idolatry, whether it be worshiping a statue, whether it be worshiping people, whatever it is, it's going to get you. And God wants God, but God requires, God has every right to our affections. You know, you can be saved and not keep his commandments. But did you know you can't love God without keeping his commandments. It says in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not if you get, if you'll be saved, keep my commandments, or if you are saved, but if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And look, just like there is punishment for idolatry, there is blessing for loving God. God said he will, you know, he's going to give mercy and blessings for those who love him. And in 1 John 5, 3, he says, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. In that second commandment, God said that you know, He was going to show mercy to thousands of them that love Me. That your love of God, it will have an effect too. It will, it will have a bigger effect than hating God. And He says, of them that love Me. And how do we love God? We keep His commandments. We follow His Word. And you know, I don't, I don't like the commandments of God. I don't want to keep the commandments of God. I'm sorry, you've been deceived. You've been fooled. You know why? Because the commandments of God are not grievous. And His commandments are not grievous. They're not 
They're not hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. Yeah, there's some challenges, but it's not as bad as transgressing the law of God. It's better. But we violate that second commandment every time we allow the things of the earth to steal our affections from God. Nothing on this earth could ever do or ever has done what God has done for you. God deserves all praise, all glory, all our adoration. Colossians 3.1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above. Let's not get caught up in things down here on this earth. Let's seek the heavenly things. Let's not get caught up in idols and statues or money or the work of our hands, what we can build, what we can accomplish. Let's focus on Christ, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's where He's at. He's in heaven. I'm not going to get caught up in the things of this earth. Why? Because I love God more. He is the one I'm serving. He's the one I'm worshiping. Jesus Christ is the one who saved me. And He's in heaven right now. So I'm going to think more about heavenly things than I am earthly things. Verse 2 says, Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. The things on the earth, these are idols. They're nothing. They only steal good from us. And what we need to do is keep our focus on Jesus Christ and anything that distracts us from that. Is an idol. You know, we don't need, if if we had a big statue of Jesus in here, you know, people are going to want to pray next to that statue. But listen, God, He's a spirit. He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He wants us to understand that we can pray anywhere. If we make these statues and these shrines and things, everybody's going to think, well, if I'm going to have a good time in prayer, I got to go to the church. I got to go to the statue. No, you can do this anywhere. You know where you're supposed to go is you're supposed to go in your closet. You're supposed to go where you, why the closet? Where you can get away from all the distractions. Where there are no idols. Where there's nothing, you know, distracting you. That is, that is why God hates idols and we need to make sure that we keep them out of our lives. Stay away from idols. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Our God, He is a jealous God. You get caught up in that stuff. God's going to be jealous. He sees you praying, you touching that statue. He's going to get jealous. When I went to Israel, we went to the Wailing Wall. And I saw. I remember watching, watching people from our own group. They got to the Wailing Wall. And the Jews, they all go out there and they all pray and they put their hands on the wall and do all that stuff. But the Baptists in our own group, they, they went out there and they like had their hands on the wall. and they're, I mean, they're just intently praying with their hands on the wall. And I'm thinking... You know, you could have did that back when we were in line, you know, waiting to come come in here. You know, it's, I just went to go to the Wailing Wall because I wanted to say I'd been there before. And I didn't realize I had desecrated it. I violated it. I got there in the wall and in the cracks in between the bricks, there's all these papers stuck in there. I'm like, what are these people doing? I started taking them out. I'm like, you know, this is this. I didn't. My dad saw me. He's like, don't do that. I'm like, why? It's like, those are people's prayers. If people would have seen me doing that, man, they'd have probably cut my hand off or something. I was like, Hope nobody, hope nobody saw that. But, but you don't need to stick your prayer into a wall. I mean, these people do. They go over to Israel. Oh, I've got cancer. I've got this. If I could just get this prayer in the wailing wall, I'll probably be cured. That's an idol. And we, we, need to, we should know better than that as Christians. You don't need to make a trip to Israel to get a good prayer in. You can do that anywhere. In your home, in your car. God is everywhere. We understand that. Let's not get caught up in these earthly things. So with that, let's all stand together.